In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, yeah. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on your name, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down. As your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name.
of our heart this morning. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. We love you so much. We want to take time to, to do that in so many ways this morning, Father, through our worship, through our love for one another, through our listening. You are so precious to us church, why don't you just do yourselves a favor and say good morning to somebody this, this morning, would you? Shake a hand. Say hi.
Well, we want to continue to worship him this morning and do so by giving back. If you came prepared this morning to do that, um, we want to give you that opportunity. I love the provision that he makes in our lives. And so the deacons will be around shortly, if that's you today. But will you pray with me? And let's give him thanks today for all that he has done. Jesus, we do love you. And we want to recognize you and continue to worship you by giving back. Lord, even on our worst day, we are blessed. Just by the very air that we are allowed to breathe, you make possible. But we have so much more. So thank you. From a heart of gratitude, we pour back into you, Father. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,
sing it, church, just you. Jesus, we love. Sing it again, church. Oh, Jesus, we love Jesus, we love struggle, God, when life is hard, when life is unfair, when life is life, Lord, you're the one we adore, we love. was lost I walked away the road was dark I could not see my hope was gone the pain was real but your mercy you saw my steps
church all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give and I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live and I surrender all and I
take time to do what we just sang. You know, Jesus said that in this life there will be trials and struggles and pain and sorrow and all of those nice little things that comes with the package of living on earth, right? And when Jesus was with his disciples at the end during the Last Supper, he set a table, he prepared a table for us, not for his sake, but for ours. Because he knew that we would need this time weekly to be reminded of his work. And so if you didn't make your way to the tables when you came in and you wish to do so now, it would be a good time. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to partake of the table that he prepared, the cup that holds the bread, which is the body that was broken for you, and the juice that represents his blood that was spilled out for your sin and mine, then uh, please make your way to the tables. And then very simply head back to your seats. Allow the Spirit of God to overcome you bring yourself before him as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 consider yourselves before you come to the table bring your stuff from the past week all the junk the things you said the things you did listen we're good at talking and sometimes we need help listening Father help us now to come prepared to your table we love you, Jesus. i 
Father, thank you for your presence here and the reminder of your goodness and grace to us. And as Jimmy said, as we move through the challenges of life as well as the mountaintop experiences, it's so comforting to know that you never leave us or forsake us, that you will be there to guide and direct us through all things. 
So we come today to simply say thank you, to acknowledge that you are our God, and that we love you. It is our heart's desire to serve you and honor you, be a blessing to you. So teach us those things that we need to learn so that we can do what we desire to do. And I pray, Lord, you'll bless your kingdom as it gathers in various places throughout the world today, here in our valley and throughout this country, that your church would be blessed and people encouraged. And we look forward to the day when we'll all be together and worship together, all tribes, all tongues, all nations, on that day as we come before your throne. So bless us, open your word now to teach us and encourage us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Good to have you here this morning. Oh, it's good to have you, as I said. Welcome again. Uh, just in your bulletins, I just want to direct you to, uh, to take a peek in there and be reminded of things that are happening. Let me highlight a couple of things, if I could. One is uh, a reminder of our Christmas Eve services, which happens to be on a Sunday this year. And so all three services, 8, 9, 15, and 11, will be focused on the Christmas story. I was praying the other day uh, about a message to share, and the Lord gave me three words, life in between. And so I began to ponder those three words, and I'm putting together a message about life in between the first coming as Jesus came as our king and the second coming when he'll return as a king, how his life makes all the difference in the world. So be praying for us as we put the service together. It's a family service. We'll have child care for those two and under, Everybody else will be together in here as a family. We'll be packing the place out, so in violation of code, I'll have you know that. Of course, we're in violation of code right now, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> but so be it. So uh, it's a great time to invite your family and your friends. Uh, it's an opportune time where most people are very receptive to that invitation. So we look forward to seeing you here. And it'll be a short service, uh, so the family won't get bored, and I, I guarantee you it'll be a fun service. Also, uh, for all the ladies of the church, just a reminder that there's a uh, Christmas uh, celebration uh, fellowship time tomorrow evening from 6 to 7.30, or not tomorrow, Tuesday evening, from 6 to th uh, 7.30. So uh, ladies, come be a part of that. It's a great time every year to come together and just enjoy fellowship and be encouraged in the Word. And if you're uh, planning on attending, if you'd stop and let it be known at the information table right by there, there's a sign-up sheet so that they can plan on how many to prepare for. That would be awesome. Then the last thing is our gifts of grace. If you'll notice in your bulletins, there is a place for you to fill out a form. If you know of a family that is in need of some Christmas help this year in the terms of presents, or if you're in need, if you would fill out that form with the uh, ages of the kids and... Uh, if you would like to purchase some gifts for that, you're more than welcome to do that. We're collecting those. And on the 18th, uh, that evening, there will be a special time where parents can come and kind of shop through the store that we'll have set up and uh, pick out gifts for their kids. And uh, it's going to be a great time. So uh, give some thought to that and uh, contribute as you can and uh, let us know if there's any needs that you have. Okay? It's good to see you. If you have your Bibles this morning, I would ask you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11 in your Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We are in a, a study that is called The Story. Uh, this is week 12 of our journey in a 31-week study through this book. It's nothing but scripture, but it is chronologically put together. It is an overview of uh, God's story of uh, creation and all the way to the completion of all things and how he is involved in and through the world and in our lives as well. And so if you'd like to have one of these books, we encourage you to get them. I was told that we're approaching 1,500 that we've given out so far. Uh, if you can afford it, they're $7. If you can't, that's fine. You can pick them up at the uh, information table. We just got three more cases in this week. And so we encourage you to do that. Also, we have over 200 plus that are listening online every week following through the story with us as well. So if you're online today, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Just remember that your tithe is double since you listen online. And uh, it's good to have you. So this week we'll be in chapter 12 of the story. We're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 11 today. There was a guy who was near death up in his second floor bedroom and 
as he was just hanging on to life, there was the waft of the smell of chocolate chip cookies being baked downstairs. And he loved chocolate chip cookies. And so he thought if I could just get downstairs and get one last cookie. So he managed to crawl out of bed. He worked his way down the hall, slithered down the stairs as best he could, crawled into the kitchen and reached over the countertop to grab a cookie. And just as he did, there was a slap of his hand and a voice that said, leave those alone. Those are for the funeral. <laughs> That's a rough way of getting your hand caught in the cookie jar, isn't it? Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a king who got his hand caught in the cookie jar. And of course, that king is David. Last week, if you were here, Pastor Jimmy uh, led you on a journey of uh, discovering this uh, incredible king that was handpicked by God to lead the people of Israel. From a little shepherd boy, kind of the runt of the litter, the smallest of his family, the most inconsequential of men who would have been chosen to be king, but Samuel the prophet anoints him. And he is soon to become king. Twenty years later, he would assume the throne. And after ending chapter 11 of the story, it's a great time in David's life. He's at the height of his reign as the king of Israel. David has won the hearts of the people. They love him. The entire nation is singing his praises. He's expanded the boundaries of the United Kingdom of the Jews of Israel and Palestine from 6,000 square miles to 60,000 square miles. His kingdom is enlarging. His kingdom is growing. His kingdom is flourishing. The military force of Israel is stronger than ever in its history. The enemies of Israel have been systematically and decisively subjugated to the control of, of Israel's strength. David's healthy, he's happy, life is good. His economy and his diplomacy are a refreshing change from his predecessor, King Saul. There was not only a, a chicken in every pot in Israel, but there were grapes on every vine. I mean, it was just a prosperous, wonderful time. And David is sitting in his new palace that he has built in Jerusalem. And as yet, there's not a blemish on his integrity. But as we close the chapter in chapter 11, we move into chapter 12, and everything is about to change as we read through the narrative of the story. We begin our, our study in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, and, and this is what we read. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. That's an interesting statement that David stayed behind at a time when he normally would have been on the battlefield leading his army against the foes of Israel, David finds himself at stead at home. Uh, David was a type, type A personality. Most leaders are. He was a man accomplished to getting things done, and he did. And so, you know, a king who stays home from battle is very seldom at rest. And so David finds himself restless in his home. And as we continue on in verse 2, we're going to see that David's eyes are going to wander a little bit, and as his eyes wander, his heart is going to follow, and it's going to wander as well. Verse 2, late one afternoon after his midday rest, by the way, I just want to say as an older, uh, as an old man, I like that. I think there's something about a good siesta. How about you guys? If it's good for King David, it's good for me. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period, and then she returned home. But later, when Bathsheba discovered she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I am pregnant. So David finds himself on the horns of a dilemma. Here he is, the king of Israel. 
He looks out over his kingdom. His rooftop was higher than all others. He sees on the rooftop there a woman bathing. And uh, he brings her in to have a relationship with her. And hearing of the pregnancy, David has to do something. And so he concocts a plan. Uh, let's call it plan A. And it's a pretty nefarious plan. If you look in verse 6, David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. Remember, that's the husband of Bathsheba. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go on home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace, but Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Plan A, pretty simple. David says, well, I'll, I'll bring Uriah home from the battlefield. I'll send him to his home. I'm sure he'll want to be with his wife. He'll sleep with her. He'll just assume that the child that's been conceived is his. But that didn't work. The plan failed as we continue to read on. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? And Uriah replied, this is the man of character and integrity that he was. The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next, and then David invited him to dinner, got him drunk, but even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So plan A doesn't work out too well. And so David is going to move to a surefire plan, and let's call it plan B, and this is what he does, verse 14. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. Now, this is interesting. I want you to notice this. Uriah is going to carry the very letter that's going to call for his execution. He's not aware of that, but David is sending it by him to Joab. And the letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines when the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Well, plan succeeded. David thinks that uh, all is taken care of. Uriah is dead. Now he can marry Bathsheba, and he does, and he brings her into his palace along with his other wives and concubines. But pretty soon, the gig is up. As David is continuing on with life in the kingdom, one day the prophet Nathan is going to show up and is going to confront David with his sin. And we read about that in chapter 12. Nathan shares a story that is going to pique the interest of David. Verse 1 of chapter 12 in 2 Samuel, the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. He ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. And one day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guests. So David listens to the story, and the Bible says that David became furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole for having no pity. Having responded that way, Nathan the prophet looks to David and then says these words, You are that man. And David knew at that moment that the sin of his past had caught up to him. And if you jump down to verse 12, David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
You know, what's interesting is when you study the story of David, he is known in Scripture, he is defined this way, as a man after God's own heart. How is it that someone who's said to be a person after God's own heart could live such a way? This part of David's story is a very tragic story. His relationship with Bathsheba highlights four major biblical truths that are intertwined through the story that I want to share with you today because in many ways David's story is our story. It's a struggle of sin. It's, it's a struggle to repent. It's a struggle of confession. It's a struggle with forgiveness and the consequences of the actions that we sometimes involve ourselves in and how that plays out in life. We have in this story what I would like to call a window. A window that we can kind of peek through and, and see these, these deep theological truths that not only were true in David's life, but are true in your life and mine. And I want to remind you that as we study Scripture, we're reminded that all the things that have been written before were written to instruct us. And so as we read these incredible stories that we've been studying about over the past several weeks, they're there for a reason. They're there as not only history lessons, but also valuable theological lessons of how we can better shape our lives to be the people that God wants us to be. Every one of us struggles with these four theological truths that I'm going to unpack for us today. Now, the first biblical truth that I want to talk with you about is the theological doctrine of this thing called sin. Anybody here heard of sin? Sure. Anybody here acquainted with sin? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Whether your name is Adam or Bill, whether your name is Eve or Debbie, it doesn't matter. Sin is your biggest problem. It's my biggest problem. And here's God through the prophet Nathan he holds David accountable for the sin that he had involved himself in. Sin is an interesting word. In the New Testament, it's from the Greek word harmartia. It's a word that was used to describe an archer drawing his bow back, releasing an arrow, trying to hit the bullseye. If you missed the bullseye, it was called a harmartia, a sin. So think of sin this way. Sin is missing the mark of what God wants us to do or how God wants us to live. And there's a pattern to sin, and this is what I want us to see this morning. What was true in David's life is still true in your life and mine, and as I'll explain in a minute, it was true at the very beginning of time. So David, first of all, is on the rooftop that day, and he looks out and he sees something that he desires. He saw a beautiful woman. The Bible says that she had unusual beauty. Now, I, I ask the question, why was Bathsheba on the rooftop? I don't know. But irrespective of why she was up there, David could have stopped watching at any time, but he didn't. And so David lingers a little bit longer, looks just a little bit longer, and as he continues to view what he sees, he desires what he is looking at. His lust overtakes his sense and his morality and his understanding of what is right and wrong. And what's amazing to me is that his, his lust and his desire for Bathsheba is so strong that he doesn't even try to hide it. He sends for people from his household to go get her and bring her back to him. Here's the truth about David. At that moment in his life, and any time you and I sin, it's true for us as well. What he wanted more was Bathsheba more than honoring God. And any time you and I are at a crossroads of making decisions in our life that affect our relationship with God, where we have an opportunity to sin, when we cross that threshold, what we are basically saying is we desire that which we see or covet or want more than we want to honor God. And so David saw, he desired, and then finally he took, as a result of that desire, something that was not rightfully his to take, another man's wife. In the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, we see the same pattern. 
God places Adam and Eve in a perfect environment and says, the garden is yours to enjoy. You can have everything in it except for one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of its fruit, you will surely die, God says. And Satan comes along and says, did God really say that? I mean, let's think this through. Here's the truth. If you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Well, that's a pretty enticing argument that the enemy lays out. And so you read in verse 6 of chapter 3, the woman was convinced of what the enemy said. Notice the progression. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Do you see a similar pattern? She saw, she wanted, and as a result of that, she took that which she knew was forbidden by God for her to have. Listen, it's not the seeing of things that's the problem. It's not even the desiring or wanting of things that's the problem. It's the ingestion of the evil that becomes the problem. It's when we allow our desires to take hold of us and we give in to those desires, that's when it becomes sin to us. James, the Lord's brother, said this in chapter 1 of his letter. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It's the enticement, it's the allurement, it's seeing, it's desiring, and then once partaking or indulging in, it becomes sin which destroys us. So write this down if you're taking notes. This is a great definition for sin. Sin is an impulse that is indulged. It's something that I know is not right for me, but I indulge in it anyway, and at that moment, it becomes sin to me. I miss the mark of what God wants me to do. And by the way, that's true whether you know the Word of God or whether you don't. Did you know that? The Bible says that God has given you this thing called a conscience and that instinctively, intuitively, we all know right from wrong, good from bad. And when we give in to a bad impulse, it becomes sin. So sin is when you... You don't let go of the thought. You fester the thought. You allow yourself to brood on the thought. You decide to host and feed the sinful thought, and that's what leads you into sin. So every one of us here is sin. The Bible says very clearly that we all struggle with this thing called sin. And so David finds himself having sinned in a very difficult situation. So one of the great biblical truths that we see attached to the story is something that helps us with our sin. It's the biblical doctrine of what we call forgiveness. Forgiveness. You see, the great news of the gospel, if you're not familiar with the story of God, is that God stands ready to forgive our sins. It's his desire to forgive each and every one of us for the things that we do in our lives that are wrong. If you're a believer here today, if you're a Christian, and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, then your sins have already been forgiven. You need to know this. When you appropriated the blood of Jesus Christ to your life, your sins, past, present, and future, have already been forgiven. And here's something that's very confusing and hard for people to understand. Our salvation is secure even when our hands are dirty. Well, how can that be? How can I, as a sinner still have the security of knowing that I'm in salvation with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's really, really important to understand this aspect of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is not conditional with God. It's unconditional. It's not dependent on how well you or I keep our nose clean. It is dependent on what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. So many people that I talk to feel like they need to keep on earning their salvation. You know, I, I've got to keep doing better. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. I've got to have more good works and more good deeds 
because if I don't do that, then maybe I'm going to lose my salvation. We all need to understand this about the doctrine of forgiveness. Forgiveness that is conditional is not forgiveness at all. It's just empty sentiment. And so when God forgives, that forgiveness is complete. It's not conditional upon your life or mine. And let me say it this way. If I say, I forgive you if you say you're sorry, well, that's not forgiveness. It's conditional upon what you do. Or I forgive you if you make things right. You know, you wrong me, and if you make them right, then I'll forgive you. That's not forgiveness. That's just empty sentiment. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to hear the completeness of forgiveness as it is taught in Scripture. And let's start with Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said this. Listen carefully. He says, I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. It's not a condition. The only condition is that you believe what I have said, that you receive me and the God who has sent me. Then you have eternal life. And he says this, They will never be condemned for their sins, for they have already passed from death to life. So let me ask the question. Are you still going to sin? Sure. Every one of us, every day, probably does things we know we shouldn't do or fails to do things we should have done. Either way, it's still sin. But Jesus said, if you have asked me into your life, if you believe in the God who sent me and have received me into your life, then you have eternal life. You've passed from death to life. You will never be condemned for your sins. That's great news for each and every one of us. So I know even though I'm not perfect, every, you know, I'm going to mess up from time to time, but God still loves me, and God still receives me. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we read this. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. If you're a Christian here today, you are forgiven. You don't need to carry around years of guilt and shame over things that maybe you have done in your life. A woman came up to me after the last service and said she had a, an affair early in her life and the daughter she has today is a result of that affair. And I said to her, I have wonderful news for you. God doesn't hold you in condemnation. God has set you free from that shame and that's sin. You're forgiven. Period. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, one of the great theological verses of the Bible. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you've been beating yourself up over the mistakes of your life, stop beating yourself up and rest in the grace and mercy of God who wants to enjoy forgiveness so that you can live to the fullest that he wants you to live. He set you free. Set yourself free from all of those things. Romans 8.33, Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. And then Romans 3, I've got to read this. Verse 23, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Every one of us in this room. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he frees us from the penalty of our sins. That's great news, you guys. So we sin. We all sin. David sinned. But David received the forgiveness of God, and God wants to extend that forgiveness to us when we sin. The prophet Nathan said to David, Yeah, you've sinned, but you are not going to die as a result of that. You're going to be forgiven your sin. So for you and I, it's important to remember that it's God who initiates this change in our status as sinners. God is the one who reconciles us to himself, and that forgiveness and reconciliation is offered to every person who accepts Christ as their Savior. Now, forgiveness of our sins doesn't mean that the consequences of our sin are removed. I'll talk about that in just a minute. 
But you've got to remember that as a Christian, your sins are forgiven. Past sins, present sins, future sins. Okay, so here's the logical argument. Okay, Tom, if what you say is true, if I sin and God just automatically forgives, then I can just keep on sinning. So what's the matter? I might as well just live as I want since God is going to forgive me. Well, the Apostle Paul anticipated that that question would be raised as he wrote the book of Romans. The greatest theological dissertation on justification by grace through faith alone that Paul writes and says it's not about what you do, it's about what God has already done. It's just appropriating what God has done to your life and living and resting in that. And so anticipating that reasoning, Paul in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says this, and this is important, listen. He says, well, then should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? (laughs) And here's what he says. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? And I want you to highlight or think about the word continue. If you continue to live in sin, you have to ask yourself, have I really given my life to the Savior? When you recognize your sin, acknowledge your sin, see your sin, and you repent of your sin, then forgiveness comes as a result of that. Forgiveness is attached to that because your conscience, your heart is attuned to God. That's what Paul is saying. Since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, that's why baptism is so important, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. So you and I have the power by the Holy Spirit to live the life that God has caused us to live. Every now and then we're going to hit a bump in the road. We're going to stub our toe. We're going to do something wrong. We're going to make a mistake. But God has forgiven you through Christ Jesus. So what do we do then? when we sin, knowing that it's going to happen. And this is the third major biblical truth that we see in the story of David and Goliath, or David and Bathsheba. And it's the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of confession. You go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11, Nathan the prophet nails David to the wall, and David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, do we know that David's confession and repentance was sincere? Well, yeah, we do. Because if you go to the Psalms, David wrote about this very instance in the Psalms. That's why in the story, chronologically, you'll see in your reading this week that these two Psalms are in your reading. So David sins with Bathsheba. He is confronted by Nathan the prophet. He confesses his sin. He says, yes, you're right. I'm the man. I did it. And David writes in response to that these words, Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me, My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. By the way, have you ever experienced that? You know you've done something wrong. You know you've made a mistake. You've been hiding it. You've been keeping it in the secret. You think no one knows about it. And you think you're going to escape through and get away with it. And my guess is if you've ever experienced that, you experienced what David just wrote about. There's a guilt attached to that. There's a shame attached to that. There is this feeling of powerlessness attached to that because we haven't been honest with God and we haven't been honest with other people. And so David says, Finally, I confessed all my sins to you. I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. That's why David was called a man after God's own heart. It wasn't that he was perfect. It was that he always knew where to come back to. His center was in God. That's why he could write in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. 
because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin. He goes on and says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. David understood that if he was going to be in relationship with God, then he needed to confess the sin that was in his life. Someone said it this way. I put this quote in your outline. To confess your sins to God is to not tell him anything he doesn't already know. God's keenly aware of your sin and mine. Until you confess your sins, however, they are the abyss between you. In other words, there's a canyon, a chasm that exists between you and God when your sins stay unconfessed. When you confess them, they become a bridge. So we're talking about relationship. Failure to confess the sin in our life destroys the relationship that God wants to have with us. If you were here at the very beginning, I said it's all about relationships, the story of God. He wants a relationship with people. He wants a relationship with you. The Apostle John said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I want you to notice something. John is not saying that we're required to confess every single sin before God will forgive us. How could we possibly do that? There are things that I've done that I'm not even aware I've done. There are sins that I've made that I wouldn't even know what to confess. But yet they're there nonetheless. John is talking about this forgiveness that has already been taken care of. It's done, it's finished by the death of Christ on the cross. With confession, we're not talking about uh, having to confess every sin. We're talking about the recognition, the understanding that we are sinners and always in need of cleansing and forgiveness. Does that make sense? So every day your prayer as a believer should be, Lord, forgive me of things that I, I'm probably not even aware that I've done, a word that I spoke maybe that hurt someone's feelings or something I did that I'm not even aware I did it yet. Lord, just forgive me. I need your forgiveness. I need to confess. And when we do that, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. And I know this probably never happens in your relationship if you're married. But let's just assume that it might in your relationship or mine. If you lose your temper and you yell at your spouse, and again, I know that never happens, but, but if it were to happen, you lose your temper, you yell at your spouse, you're no less married than you were the day before you yelled at your spouse. Does that make sense? You're still married. But when you confess the sin, when you say to your spouse, honey, I'm sorry I said what I said yesterday. Or I'm sorry I did what I did or failed to do what you asked me to do. When I do that, it's a bridge that I'm building back to a harmonious relationship with my spouse. That's what God wants us to do. Confession builds that bridge and gets us back in that harmonious relationship with God. What, what did David say, Psalm 32? He said, when I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. But he said, when I confessed my sin, my guilt was lifted, my shame was gone, and my relationship with God is back where it needed to be. That's powerful. So sin is a theological truth of your life and mine. Forgiveness is a theological truth that God forgives the sinner if the sinner's life is hid in the blood of his precious son, Jesus Christ. And that confession is something that God brings into our life so that we can be in harmonious relationship with him. But then there's something that I need to talk with you about. It is about this thing called consequences. If you go back to confession, confession is really just agreeing with God about your sin and acknowledging his perspective of it. So God, you're right, I'm wrong. What you say is true, what I've done is wrong. I acknowledge it, and I'm lining myself up with you. So God forgives. We're back in relationship with him. The bridge has been built. There's harmony. Guilt and shame are no longer attached to my life. But as we see in the life of David, and as with every time we sin, 
there are consequences that we have to deal with. There are consequences to David's sin. There are consequences to your sin and mine. David's sin was forgiven. Your night, your sin is forgiven. But the aftermath of sin is so often disastrous in our lives. It was disastrous in David's lives. And sometimes we think there shouldn't be consequences. It's like the little boy that grew up on a farm and they only had an outhouse to use as a bathroom and he hated the outhouse. It was cold in the winter, hot in the summer. It stunk all the time. And he decided he was going to get rid of the outhouse. It was down by the creek, and so he waited for the storms to come. And as the creek rose, one morning early he got up, and he found a pole, and he pushed against the top of the outhouse, and it tumbled into the creek, and it floated away. He went off to school, and he came home that night, and his dad said, Son, I need you to meet me in the woodshed. Well, the boy knew something was wrong. So he goes to the woodshed and he says, Dad, what's up? And his dad says, Son, someone pushed our outhouse into the creek and I think that someone was you. And the boy said, You're right, Dad, I did it. And then a thought came to his mind. They had just studied that day about George Washington in school. And he said, Dad, but you know, George Washington, when he cut down the cherry tree, he confessed that he did it and nothing happened to him as a result of that. And the dad turned to the boy and said, well, that's true, but George Washington's father wasn't in the cherry tree when he cut it down. There's consequences. So think about this. And here, I, I really want to leave you with this thought this morning. This is how powerful sin is in your life and mine. As I started out this message, I told you that David was at the height of his career. He was happy. The kingdom was being blessed. There was prosperity in the land. There was peace in the kingdom. But all that changed with one moment in time when David made a fatal mistake. When he saw something and desired it so much that he took what was not rightfully his and that changed his life and the kingdom's life forever the baby that was conceived between David and Bathsheba would die. And David, as you read in Scripture, would almost lose his mind over the death of that child. His son Amnon conspired with his uncle to rape his half-sister Tamar. That's in his own family, in the king's family. His other son, Absalom, two years later, would kill his brother, Amnon. So David would deal not only the death of the child, now he deals with the death of his son, Amnon, killed by his other son, Absalom. And then as if that's not bad enough, Absalom would attempt to take the throne away from David, and he would later himself be killed for that. And so David weeps the loss of three children in his life all because of one fateful day when he made a decision to carry out what he knew in his heart was not rightfully his to do. My point is this. Up until David's sin with Bathsheba, everything was well. But afterward, his kingdom and family suffered greatly. And so here's what you need to take home. Consequences are what we live with as a result of our sin. And they remind us of the results of our sin. God forgives. The sin is taken away. Relationship is restored as we confess them to God. But the consequences are often left for us to deal with and they are a vivid reminder of how powerful sin is in our lives. They're like a ripple effect for our lives. If there's lessons that I could give you to take home, there would be four. The four simple words. The first is this. Resist. Resist temptation. Because the enemy knows your weakest spot better than you do. And every one of us has one here. 
So resist. Build walls around you where necessary to keep the evil one from entering into your life and leading you down that path of temptation. Second word I would share with you is this. Confess. If there's something in your life that you know is not right, if there's something that is amiss, and I can't share this strongly enough with you because I care for you, confess it. Acknowledge to God, this is not right in my life. And I'm sorry, God. Whatever it might be for you, and you know what it is, even as I'm saying these words, it's coming to your mind. Confess to God like David did. Oh God, create in me a clean heart and help me to live for you. Third word, experience. Experience the forgiveness and grace and mercy of God. If there's something in your life in the past that is bringing guilt and shame into your life, reach out to Jesus, invite him into your life, experience his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness so that those chains can be broken once and for all. And then fourthly, accept. Whatever the consequences of your sin might be today, learn to accept it. It's not maybe what you would want it to be, but it's there as a visual reminder to you of the consequences of sin in your life so that you can avoid that in the future. You look at the story of David and Bathsheba and you think it's just a story about lust. You think it's just a story about adultery or just a story about murder, but it's so much more than that, you guys. It's the story of sin and forgiveness and confession and consequences. And what was true then is still true today. So my prayer for us is that we would be a people who learn well from those who have gone before us and appropriate these principles into our life today as well. Cam and Christina are going to lead us in a song to close, and I would ask you to just stand with me this morning as they sing. And while they sing, I'll be down here and others will be here. Maybe you need to talk to somebody, pray with somebody. Maybe you're ready today to make that decision to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're here to talk with you and visit with you and help you with any of those decisions today, okay? Can I pray for us? And let's sing, and then you're released to go. God bless you guys. Father, thanks for this day, this chance to be together as your kids. Thank you for, uh, for David's life. Thank you for the honesty of his life, his willingness to to come clean, his willingness to confess, his willingness to move forward in his life. And so, Lord, help us to do just the same. Bless us as your kids to be truthful and honest and faithful to you, I pray. In Jesus' name.
from the fear of serving others and from the fear of death or trial from the fear of humility deliver me oh God yes dear 